Welcome back. In this video, I wanted to spend some time talking about surface effects at the nanoscale, and in particular, what happens when we shrink down volumes to nanometer dimensions, how the surface becomes a very important part of our system. So in order to start thinking about this, I want you to consider the Humble Sphere. If I calculate the surface area of the sphere, I can do that with a pretty simple formula, 4 pi r squared. <clears throat> to calculate the volume of a sphere, that's 4 thirds pi r cubed, where r is the radius of my sphere. Now one way to think about how large my surface area is I, is to compare it to the volume. And to do that, we can calculate what's known as the surface area to volume ratio. So if I divide my surface area, 4 pi r squared, divide that by the volume, and cancel out terms and so forth, I get a final answer of 3 over r as my ratio. So the main point is that as r decreases, in other words, as the radius of my sphere decreases, the surface area to volume ratio increases. Or put another way, as dimensions become very small, there, there is more and more surface area per unit volume. And as a result, fluids that I put in my devices get exposed to larger and larger surface areas. And this has important implications for certain types of devices. So let's take another look at a more relevant example. I have here two systems. One system is a macro scale pipe. So this might be a pipe carrying water. So it's five millimeters in diameter. So still fairly small, but certainly not nanoscale and one centimeter long. Now if I calculate my uh, surface area on this, I get 1.571 centimeters squared. And if I calculate the volume, I get 0 0.196 centimeters cubed. If I divide the surface area by the volume, I get 800 per meter. So a surface area to volume ratio of 800. Now, if I think about a nano channel, which is orders of magnitude smaller, so let's assume it's got a square cross section and the width and the height is 100 nanometers both, but the same length is my pipe, so one centimeter long. If I calculate the surface area of this channel, I get four times 10 to the minus fifth centimeters squared and a volume of one times 10 to the minus 10th centimeters cubed if I calculate the surface area to volume ratio of this, I get 4 times 10 to the seventh per meter. So in other words, the surface area to volume ratio of my nano channel is 50,000 times as large as the surface area to volume ratio of my pipe. So in other words, I have 50,000 times as much surface area per unit volume of fluid that flows through my device. What this means, practically speaking, is that some things work much, much better as dimensions become small. So take home point. At the nanoscale, surface area to volume ratio is huge. And by huge, we mean millions, tens of millions, even hundreds of millions, and typically several orders of magnitude larger than macro scale objects. The implications of this are that some things work better. So processes that depend upon surfaces become much more effective, much more efficient at the nanoscale. So absorption and cooling are two good examples. If I'm trying to promote the attachment of molecules in my solution to a surface, I want the largest surface area possible. So simply by flowing fluids through a nano channel, I can very efficiently absorb many, many more molecules per unit area than in a large beaker, for instance. Also important is, is uh, radiation or processes that, that cool off um, heat, heat exchangers. So 
cooling occurs because heat radiates through surfaces and it's a function of the surface area that a fluid is flowing through. So by shrinking down a device and greatly increasing the surface area, I can more efficiently radiate heat away. And in fact, cooling is one reason we can, we can use a process known as capillary electrophoresis, because as we shrink down our device, we can generate more and more heat and still use the device without melting our gel or denaturing our DNA. What this also means too, though, is that surface charge in the channel is something we have to think about when we analyze our systems and think about designing our systems. So what I wanted to spend the rest of the video showing you a little bit about is what the surface charge looks like and how it changes depending upon the environment. So first up is what does the surface charge in a nano channel look like? So here I want you to envision a glass device, a piece of glass that has been machined to, and has a nano scale channel buried within it. So in three dimensions, you can envision just a simple square cross-sectional nano channel buried deep inside a piece of glass. And if I take a, a top-down view of this nano channel, this is what I would see, right? And let's pretend it's full of just air for now. So I have air in the middle of my channel, and I have glass on the outside of the channel. So the, it's a completely glass device. Glass is silicon bonded to oxygen. And so if I zoom into the interface, this is what I see. I see a series of silicon and oxygen bonds, and I have here a dashed line and the dashed line represents the physical boundary of the wall. So at the physical boundary of the wall, if I zoom in far enough, what I notice is that I, the wall is essentially made of exposed oxygen atoms. And the oxygen atoms typically attract hydrogen, hydrogen atoms to them because of the charge. And these OH groups are called hydroxyl groups. But if I zoom in close, what I see is essentially a wall of oxygen but then hydrogens that have come along and stuck to the surface of my nanochannel. Now, this is where the change comes in. The hydroxyl groups can change depending on the type of solution that's in my, my nanochannel. So let's take a look at what happens if we have acid and base. So say I take some acid and I fill my channel with acid instead of air. So now it's got a liquid in it. And I zoom in to my wall. This is what I see. Okay, I see, on average, less hydrogens stuck to the wall than before. And the reason is because acid is essentially many free hydrogen atoms floating around in solution. Now, because there's a lot of hydrogen already in the solution, I only lose a couple of hydrogen atoms from the wall. And the reason is because it's a concentration gradient driven process. If I have lots of hydrogens, there's going to be less tendency for the hydrogens to go into the bulk solution because there's already a bunch in there. And indeed, this is, this is why we see a change when we put a base in. If I put then flush out my acid and put base, base has far fewer hydrogen ions floating around in solution. And as a result, almost all of my surface hydrogens hop off. And so the take home story is that in a basic solution, in a higher pH, in a basic solution, I have more negative surface charge. So the more basic my solution, the more negative this surface charge is going to be. And the reason is because the hydrogens have all jumped off and gone into the bulk fluid. So let's see what happens if we take a basic solution and put some salt water, some salt in the solution, and how that changes the behavior. So we put ions into our solution, let's say with sodium chloride or potassium chloride, or even phosphate buffered saline, some sort of salt. And then we also have a base, and we zoom into the wall. This is what we would, we would see. I have down here my oxygens that are all um, negatively charged, and I have here a few a few hydrogens are still stuck to the surface. The, um, there's two important things I wanted to point out in this situation. We have free ions in solution, 
And what you typically see is two distinct phenomena. The first is in a layer very close to the surface, I have what's called, or you have what's called the stern layer. And the stern layer is a layer that has ions firmly attached to the surface. So these ions are fixed, essentially. They do not move. They're like magnets that are stuck to a refrigerator. Once they're stuck, they're on there. They aren't jumping around. They're stationary. Um, and they don't, they don't slide around. They don't typically hop off. If I move a little further away, what I tend to see is atoms that are still jiggling, jiggling around in solution. So these are, high, these are my salt ions, positively charged salt ions. And they're kind of moving around randomly. But I have a higher concentration here than in the bulk fluid. This layer is known as the diffuse layer. So the diffuse layer is a layer next to the stern layer. It's thicker than the stern layer. The stern layer is typically only one ion thick, whereas the diffuse layer is much thicker by several orders of magnitude. The diffuse layer, unlike the stern layer, is movable. And we use that fact to create electrokinetic flow, as we, like we talked about in one of the other videos. These ions move around, but they stay relatively close, con closely confined to the surface. So take home messages. There's two layers that form at the surface when you have ions in solution and at a basic pH. In other words, when you have an expo a significant amount of negative charge, charge at your surface, at the wall of your channel. The stern layer, which is fixed, and the diffuse layer, which is movable. There's also a different set of names for these layers and a couple of different considerations as well. If I look at my wall again, here I have my oxygen ion atoms exposed. Here I have my salt ions that are stuck. And remember, this is the stern layer, this single layer. The dashed line here that separates the stern layer from the diffuse layer is known as the shear plane. And the reason it's because, called the shear plane is because this defines the plane which separates the moving ions from the stationary ions. And this is an important concept in electrokinetic flow when we pump flu fluids using simply an electric field. The shear plane, if you were to stick a potentio, uh, potentiometer in here, the shear plane has something known as the zeta potential, the amount of charge accumulated there. And it has a zeta potential of typically on the order of millivolts, tens of millivolts, right? So 10 millivolts, 30 millivolts. So the, there is a potential difference here because of the accumulated charge. And the zeta potential um, determines, there is an important function that determines the variety of the layer thickness um, next to the channel wall. The diffuse layer has another name. In addition to diffuse layer, it's also sometimes called the Debye length. or lambda sub d. And again, the Debye length is the same thing as the diffuse layer, and it has the same, it has the same thickness. But that's just an alternative name that you see. The Debye length, though, the Debye length, lambda d, is the length at which the thermal motion, the thermal motion of the ions, or the thermal, the energy associated with their motion is equal to the electrostatic attraction from the wall. So if I'm an ion and I'm floating around here, I feel much stronger electrostatic attraction to the wall because I'm closer. Now if I get a little further away, I feel less electrostatic attraction. Finally, when I'm here, at about the Debye length, my my energy from thermal motion is roughly equal to the force I feel. It's roughly equal to my electrostatic um, attraction, and so this this point defines the final the final length of the of the Debye length. 
The by length is typically on the order of tens of nanometers. So it is well within the scale or size regime of nanochannels, much, much larger than ions though, of course. And the reason it's significant is because in nanochannels, the Debye length can occupy a significant fraction of the total nanochannel width. And this has important implications in electrokinetic flow, as we'll see in another video. Now, if you want to calculate the Debye length, um, let's see. Oops. If you want to calculate the Debye length, so this, these bullet points just summarize what I've just told you. If you want to calculate the Debye length, you can use this formula. And this assumes a symmetric electrolyte. So this assumes you have basically equal positive and negative charges in your electrolyte. So sodium chloride or potassium chloride, which are commonly used salts. The Debye length is calculated by knowing several parameters about my system. I need to know the relative and permittivity and the permittivity of free space, Boltzmann temperature, the charge of my electrons and the number density and the charge of ions and the number density of ions far away from the wall. So this n infinity is essentially the concentration of my ions out in bulk solution uh, far away from the wall, not close to the wall where it's where it is increased. And this concludes the discussion of surface charge in nanochannels.